All yeah. right. Perfect. Um, so thanks for having me today. I am the Forest Health Program Manager at the Virginia Department of Forestry. And so basically what we do on our program is we monitor the state of Virginia for forest health disturbances. And that includes invasive insects, um, tree diseases, non-native invasive plants, and then also some abiotic disturbances like severe storms, drought, flooding. So we do uh, a lot of different things. And today I'm gonna just kind of give you a background on what our program does and some information on some of the significant forest health threats that we're seeing in Virginia. But first of all, why do we care about forest health? And I think probably everyone here could answer this question. Um, I'm hoping that you tuned into this webinar because you do care about forest health. But healthy forests are important because they provide us with clean water, clean air, um, habitat for wildlife, recreational opportunities, and then also wood products. Unfortunately, there are quite a few threats to forest health in our region. Um, urban growth and development can lead to forest loss and fragmentation. Uh, storms can significantly damage our forests. And then of course, invasive species. And so definitely invasive plants, but also other invasive species like invasive insects and uh, tree diseases. And my program spends a lot of time focusing on these invasive species because as we all know, when you introduce a new species to a region, um, there are often less natural enemies to, to control the population of that species. Um, often hosts lack resistance and so these invasive species are able to rapidly reproduce and cause significant damage. So our program tries to monitor forest health throughout the state of Virginia, and we use a variety of different techniques to do that. One thing we do is we put out traps for specific insect pests. And we trap for um, a few different reasons. Sometimes we'll trap in an area where we know there is a specific pest and we're trapping to understand more about the population of that insect. Um, are populations increasing or are they at stable levels? And then sometimes we'll also trap to determine whether or not that pest is present in a region. And so that's just trying to detect if it's there or not. And so here are some examples of some traps that we've deployed. Um, over here on the left, you'll see some spotted lanternfly traps. We have the sticky bands and then the, uh, the newer spotted lanternfly trap, which is a modified circle trap. In the center, we have one of our employees setting up a southern pine beetle trap. And then over here is a purple prism trap for the emerald ash borer. Uh, we used to do a lot more EAB trapping when EAB was first detected in Virginia. At this point, it's pretty widespread throughout the state, so we don't do much EAB trapping anymore. And then over here on the right, you see some folks setting up a red bay ambrosia beetle trap. And we'll talk more about some of these specific pests later. Another thing we do to try to monitor forest health is we'll actually do aerial surveys. If there's a really significant forest health disturbance that's causing damage, uh, widespread damage across our forest canopy, we'll actually get in an airplane and try to map out that damage so we can get a map of the full extent of the damage. Um, and so obviously this is something we would only do for something that's causing severe damage across um, a widespread area, something like the spongy moth that was previously called the gypsy moth. Um, if, we, if we hear reports of the spongy moth defoliating large areas of our forest, we'll get in a, a, an airplane and do an aerial survey to try to map out that damage. For smaller uh, forest damage, we'll often use drones. And so we're just kind of figuring out how to fully incorporate drones into our forest monitoring activities. There's a lot of different things we can do with drones, but even something as simple as just sending it up into the sky to get a picture of the canopy, that can often be really useful information. Um, you know, when you're walking in the woods doing ground surveys, sometimes it's hard to fully understand the extent of the damage. So just having that image uh, of the canopy can be really useful. And we're also learning how to incorporate imagery into our forest health program. And again, we are just scratching the surface of what we can use satellite imagery for. 
But here we have a screenshot from a web-based program that actually uh, uses imagery to measure the greenness of the canopy. And then um, this program compares how green the canopy currently is to how green it was in previous years. And so if there's a big deviation, if the canopy is currently less green than it was in previous years, that's an indicator of a potential forest health disturbance. And so we use this satellite imagery to help direct where we should go do additional ground and aerial surveys. So uh, we have a great job because we do a lot of different things. We deal with a lot of different pests, uh, pathogens, uh, and plants, and we use a variety of techniques to monitor those forest health disturbance agents. And so today I just wanna go through some significant forest health threats that uh, we're dealing with in Virginia. I wanna give an update on pine bark beetles and then we'll move to oak decline. And then I also wanna to touch on some emerging pests such as the spotted lanternfly, laurel wilt disease and beech leaf disease. So we'll start with pine bark beetles. And we have a number of native pine bark beetles here in our region. And I really like this graphic because it lists the most common native pine bark beetles that we have in our, our region here. The first three are Ips beetles. Um, we have a few different species of Ips beetles in our area. The four spined engraver Ips beetle, the five spined engraver beetle, and then the six spined engraver beetle. And they're actually named because of the number of spines that you can see on the end of their abdomen. And so we can actually identify these species by looking at them under a microscope. We also have the southern pine beetle here, and the bottom is the black turpentine beetle. So these are all native species, meaning they're all, they all exist in low numbers in, in our landscapes, and they do tend to have natural enemies that help control their populations. And our pine trees do tend to have some host resistance to them. So generally, these species only attack trees that are already stressed. Um, however, they can sometimes uh, grow in populations where they are able to reach outbreak levels, and that's when they can cause significant damage to our forests. So one of our pine bark beetles is the southern pine beetle. And the southern pine beetle is the most destructive native forest insect in the southeast, in the southeast where pine is prevalent and economically important. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a native beetle, so it generally only attacks trees that are already stressed or weak or old, but it can mass attack and overwhelm healthy trees. And that's when spots can expand rapidly into outbreaks, and that's when we can see significant forest damage. So here are some things to look out for. Here are signs of a southern pine beetle infestation. The first thing I always look for are pitch tubes on the trunk of a pine tree. And so you can see pictures of these pitch tubes here on the left here. Um, as the beetles bore into the tree, the tree responds by pushing out resin to try to push the beetle out. And that's when these pitch tubes develop on the, the bark of the pine tree. Um, they kind of just look like little uh, kernels of popcorn. As the, tr uh, as the beetle bores into the tree, sawdust falls down around the base of the tree. So that's something else to look for as uh, photographed in this middle image right here. And then once the southern pine beetles bore into the tree, they create feeding tubes or galleries um, just on the other side of the bark. And so you can see that here in this photo, these S-shaped galleries. And so if you're able to peel the bark off the tree, you should be able to see these galleries. And here's what a southern pine beetle spot looks like from above. And I really like this picture because you can clearly see which direction the beetles are moving. You can see the area right here where the spot started. Um, and these are now the vacated trees. These are the trees that were first infested um, and then they died, they lost their needles and the beetles moved on to other trees. The other trees um, in, in the direction that the beetles are moving are called faders. And so the needles on these trees have started to fade from green to yellow to orange to red, um, but they still remain on the tree. And then at the very leading edge of the southern pine beetle infestation are the fresh trees that are just beginning to be infested with the beetle. 
So this is a good image um, and it can show, it shows what a typical Southern pine beetle spot looks like. Um, however, you know, we don't just see Southern pine beetle in large areas of forests like this. We can see Southern pine beetle in more residential areas as well. So I wanted to also show you some photos of Southern pine beetle spots that are like really just in people's backyards. These top two photos are uh, from Chincoteague. They had a big southern pine beetle outbreak uh, a few years ago. And again, this is just in someone's backyard and this is just in someone's campground. These were old stressed trees um, that were attacked by southern pine beetle. On the bottom left here, this is a southern pine beetle spot. Uh, I believe this was in Hanover County a while back in a, a neighborhood that had a lot of old pine in it. And they lost a lot of trees to southern pine beetles. And then over here on the bottom right, I think this is actually Ips bark beetles. Um, but again, this is just in a neighborhood by a tennis court. These were these trees were already stressed, and so they were attacked by Ips bark beetles. Now we have a southwide southern pine beetle trapping program to try to monitor populations of the southern pine beetle in the southeast. And so you can see here, this map is a, a map of all trap locations from a few years ago. Virginia participates in this program every spring, and we usually deploy between 24 and 30 southern pine beetle traps in high-risk areas in Virginia. And so those would be areas that have uh, significant um, densities of pine trees and have historically had higher levels of southern pine beetle outbreaks. Um, here you can see uh, a southern pine beetle trap. It has 12 funnels that eventually uh, lead to a collection cup on the bottom. And we attach lures to this trap that mimic the volatiles of a pine tree and also the pheromones of southern pine beetles. We leave these traps out for four weeks in the spring, and then we count all of the southern pine beetles that we collect, as well as uh, another beetle, a clared beetle, which are actually predators of the southern pine beetle. So we collect all this data and we put it into a southwide southern pine beetle prediction portal. And this portal uses a bunch of fancy mathematical formulas to then tell us the probability that a southern pine beetle outbreak will occur in the county that we trapped in. And so this is the data from 2023 based on uh, the results from our trapping efforts this spring. And so all of the counties that are highlighted on this map down here are counties where we, we put up traps and we collected data. And so you can see the county highlighted in red here, this is Cumberland County, um, has the highest uh, probability that there will be a southern pine beetle outbreak in that county. And then the counties in orange, uh, this is Hanover and Chesterfield, they also uh, kind of were, were alerted as um, having a, a higher probability of a southern pine beetle outbreak. So these are counties that we will definitely continue to monitor in the future. And we do this trapping every year just to try to uh, understand more about southern pine beetle in Virginia and where we should um, be focusing our monitoring efforts. Okay, so um, before I move on to oak decline, were there any questions specifically about the southern pine beetle? I asked Evan to kind of try to um, collect questions as we go because I'm going to be jumping around from topic to topic. Yes, we did have um, one question. Is there anything we can do to reduce the stress on pine trees? Yeah, so one of, um, if, if we're talking about like a, a pine stand, one of the biggest things you can do to prevent a southern pine beetle outbreak is to thin that pine stand. Um, thinning, you know, in increases the health of the pine stand, but also as you thin uh, a stand, it allows more airflow in between the trees and that disrupts the pheromones of the southern pine beetle. So that significantly reduces the stand's susceptibility to the southern pine beetle. Um, if we're just thinking about like trees in your backyard, um, you know, just simple practices like mulching, limiting soil compaction, anything you would do for any other tree to help re to help reduce stress to that specific tree. All right, and we've got a couple more questions about pine beetles. Uh, one is, can the trees survive the damage once they've been infested? 
usually not for pine beetles. Once um, once a tree is infested with pine beetles, um, it's it's probably going to die. And then a follow up to that is how long will that take? Usually within a season. So it's it's pretty important to monitor your pine trees. Um, and as soon as you see some of the, the signs and symptoms that we went over, like the pitch tubes or the sawdust or the galleries or the needles turning red, um, a, a management strategy would be to cut and remove all impacted trees. Okay, and then um, another question related to that, will the state help remove trees on private property? And also, could you talk about in forests, what the state does like on public? Yeah, so we do have a pine bark beetle prevention program. And within that program, we have a couple of cost share programs. Um, those, these are mainly programs for pine stands greater than five acres. Um, but we do have a pre-commercial thinning cost share program where we'll provide financial assistance to help you thin your pine stand. Um, if we're talking less than five acres or like yard trees, unfortunately, we don't have any assistance programs for that. Uh, are there any arborist treatments that can reduce pine bark beetles? And then the last question I saw was specifically about Rockingham County. Um, and then we do have a question about oak decline as well, but maybe we can do those at the end once that aren't really yeah let me let me just uh answer one more question about the the arborist management strategies and then we'll get into oak decline um so there are uh pesticides that you that you can spray that are labeled for pine bark beetles um the problem with these pesticides is you would have to really spray the entire tree to make it an effective treatment um, you know, Ips beetles can attack the very canopy of the tree. Southern pine beetle can attack anywhere on the tree. Black turpentine be beetles really just attack the, the base of the tree. Um, so if you can be sure that you have black turpentine beetles, spraying pesticide on the lower like six to 10 feet of the tree could be an effective manage management strategy. Um, but if you're trying to spray for southern pine beetle or Ips bark beetle, you need to spray the entire tree. Um, and that can, you know, you'd have to hire someone to bring in equipment. It can be done, but it's often not worth the cost and the effort to do that. Thanks, Lauren. Okay. So let's move on to oak decline because one of the most frequent questions we get is what's happening to all the oak trees? Why are my oak trees dying? Um, it's really common to go out in Virginia and see oak decline. And unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. So let's talk about it a little bit. The symptoms of oak decline are typically crown dieback, progressing from the top down and outside inward, premature autumn leaf color and foliage that turns brown but remains on the tree, and then eventually tree mortality that can occur a few years or even decades. So we define oak decline as the gradual failure in the health of a tree that results from the interaction between three groups of stress factors, predisposing, inciting, and contributing. And so the two main things uh, here are that it's a gradual decline. It doesn't happen suddenly. Um, we get a lot of calls from folks that say their tree, their oak tree just suddenly died um, in most of those cases, it's that these folks just suddenly noticed that their tree was dying. But in reality, it's been a gradual decline over many years. The other important thing here is that oak decline is an interaction between lots of different stress factors, lots of different things all acting on our oaks. There is usually not one single causal agent, which can be really frustrating because it often makes it really hard to diagnose. Um, and hard to manage. And so this is just a graphic that shows those different groups of stress factors, predisposing, inciting, and contributing that all are acting on oaks to cause oak decline. And so we'll get into each of these uh, groups of stress factors, starting with predisposing. Predisposing factors weaken the tree over time. And these are often abiotic and have to do with site conditions such as poor soil, topography, um, competition. 
Also advanced age is a pretty important predisposing factor. Um, folks tend to forget that trees don't live forever. And as they get into their mature ages and the natural end of their, their lifespans, um, they naturally just get weaker and are more susceptible to other stress factors. Also, just being in an urban environment is a disp disposing factor for our oak trees um, and all the stress that just comes along with being in an urban environment. That soil compaction, pollution, um, heat island effects, all of those things just make trees, oak trees growing in an urban environment have a, a shorter natural lifespan. And so all of these factors weaken the tree over time and just kind of lower that baseline level of health of an oak tree. Then we have inciting factors, and these rarely kill the tree outright, but they initiate decline and push that tree further towards, uh, towards tree death. These are things like defoliating insects, drought events, and frosts. So I tend to think of these as kind of like one-time events um, that usually don't kill the tree outright, but they definitely push it further into this spiral of decline and make it much more susceptible to secondary pests and pathogens that can then attack the tree and cause mortality. Um, defoliating insects are really common in Virginia, both native insects like the fall canker worm and also invasive insects like the spongy moth. Um, we had a, a pretty sizable spongy moth outbreak in Virginia this year. Um, usually one defoliation, defoliation event won't kill a tree outright, but when you have multiple consecutive years of defoliation, that can certainly link, lead to long-term damage. And then certainly drought events and um, frost can be inciting factors. So all of those other factors that we talked about, the predisposing and the inciting factors, those have now really weakened these oak trees and make them much more susceptible to these contributing factors, which are secondary pests and pathogens that ultimately lead to tree death. And so we have a lot of contributing factors in Virginia, and it's really easy when we go out to look at dying oak trees to find a lot of these secondary pests and pathogens um, but they rarely are the things that actually killed the tree. There were a lot of things that weaken the tree up to this point, which enable these contributing factors to come in and ultimately lead to tree death. So some common factors are the two-line chestnut borer that we see photographed here, um, armillaria root rot. You can see the fruiting bo bodies of this pathogen in the middle here. And then on the left photo, or sorry, the right photo is hypoxylin canker. Um, its new name is Bisconioxia canker. This is super common in our forest. Pretty much any dying oak tree that you see will probably have this. It's this gray canker that you can see once the bark starts to come off a dying oak tree. And so all of these things are kind of just the last nail in the coffin that ultimately kill the tree. And so I mentioned this decline spiral, um, and here it is. This is the decline disease spiral, which again just shows these different stress factors. On the outer part of the spiral, you see the predisposing factors, and then the middle here of the spiral is inciting factors, and then in the center are the contributing factors that ultimately lead to tree death. And so I just wanted to highlight again a few that are really common in Virginia. Again, an urban environment, that's a huge predisposing factor that really puts a lot of stress on oak trees. And old age, um, we're really seeing a lot of our oaks just reach these old ages. And I think like a whole presentation could be made on this, but unfortunately we lost a lot of our, almost all of our chestnuts right at the same time when the chestnut blight hit. And so what came up after that? Well, a lot of oaks. And so a lot of our oaks came up at the same time, which means a lot of them are reaching these old ages at the same time. And that's a huge predisposing factor for, uh, for our oaks here in Virginia. And then some inciting factors that are really common, defoliating insects. We already talked about those. Um, there's kind of two groups of defoliating insects. There are spring defoliators, such as the spongy moth, 
they cause um, a lot of damage because if you if a tree loses all of its leaves in the spring, it's going to use some of its reserves to push out a new flush of leaves for the rest of the season. Um, we also have another group of defoliating insects that come out later in the season, like right now is a great time to go out and find caterpillars, but they actually cause less damage to the tree because it's the end of the season, the tree's about to lose all of its leaves anyway. Um, so if a tree's defoliated now, it's probably not gonna use up any reserves to push out a new flush of leaves. But defoliating insects in general are a pretty big inciting factor here. And then also drought. I think we're seeing um, a lot more that weather is a huge factor in oak decline. You know, we have these fluctuating periods of drought and wet weather. And so if you've got oak roots that are sitting in saturated soil for an extended period of time, and then we have uh, drought conditions for an extended period of time, that's really hard on oak roots and can lead to some uh, root disease issues. So I'm seeing more and more that I think our weather patterns uh, play a huge role in the oak decline that we're seeing statewide. Now, unfortunately, um, you can't reverse oak decline. So once a tree has kind of entered in this decline spiral, there's really no way to reverse it. Uh, but what we can do is we can try to take preventative measures to reduce stress factors, specifically predisposing factors. That's kind of where we have the most control. So, you know, doing really just simple things like mulching to limit soil compaction um, and trying to reduce some of these predisposing stress factors in a preventative way to try to keep our oaks healthy is really um, our best bet here. Did I have any specific questions about oak decline? Yes, we have lots of questions about oak decline. Um, a couple of people asked about species. Somebody said they see it in, a lot in pin oaks, and then someone else asked about red or white oaks. Are there any species that seem to be more effective? You know, I used to think that we were seeing it more in red oaks. I think there's something about white oaks that make them slightly more resistant to drought conditions. Um, but lately, I've been seeing it across the board. Um, so I think, I think oak decline really is impacting all of our oaks. Okay. And then a couple questions about what is a typical life, lifespan of an oak tree, um, especially in an urban environment? Oh, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that question because it, it depends so much on just the, the site conditions, um, the different stress factors. You know, we, we think of oaks, you know, living hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think a lot of people get really attached to oaks because they feel like, you know, they've, they've gone, they've lived through generations. Um, but that's not always the case. And it really just depends on the site condition, the site index. So I'm not, I'm not going to try to answer that question right now. Perfect. Okay. Another question about woolly oak gall. Is that a problem that you see? Um, I don't know if I'm specifically familiar with woolly oak gall. I know there's a lot of galls out there and I, I would certainly think that they're a stress factor. Um, if it's a, it's usually not something that's going to outright kill the tree, um, but it would, you could definitely add it to this list of stress factors, probably an inciting stress factor. Okay. And then we have a question. Um, so how, at what point does like an insect that might just be eating leaves become an actual pest where it's considered a defoliating insect? That's a problem. I mean, any, any defoliating pest is taking away surface area for photosynthesis. So any defoliator is causing some level of damage. Um, when we're out trying to like map forest damage, we're really only mapping severe defoliation where pretty much like the, the entire tree is defoliated. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a specific threshold, but certainly when you get to the level of like complete defoliation, that's a huge stress factor. Now, again, if you have a perfectly healthy tree that's defoliated, that tree can recover. Um, but if a tree is already stressed due to a number of other factors and then it's completely defoliated, that could certainly lead to long-term damage, especially if that defoliation happens for multiple consecutive years. Okay. And then Monica has a really great question about replacements. What would you recommend if people maybe have lost a tree and they're looking for a replacement? 
So we are, we are not saying don't plant oaks. Um, oaks are still great trees to plant. So, you know, if, you, if you've got a big oak tree that's like reached the end of its life stage and dies, I think it's perfectly fine to replant an oak tree. You know, we, we want to encourage oak regeneration. We've got a cohort of, or a cohort of oaks that are reaching their mature ages. And so we, we're doing, um, we've got a, a habit, a hardwood initiative here at the Department of Forestry to try to encourage oak regeneration. Um, so we're certainly not saying don't plant oaks. So that's, that's definitely an option. Um, I'm, there's a, a lot of other species you could plant and our urban foresters or your local area forester could give you a, a specific list for like your specific site. Okay, the hardwood project, that's where you guys have the, you can purchase trees through the Department of Forestry. Our hardwood initiative um, it has a, a few different programs. Um, Joe Rossetti is our hardwood coordinator. And so he's someone you could reach out to if you have questions. Um, but basically, we're just trying to encourage better management of hardwood stands. Okay, perfect. If anybody else has questions, just drop them in the chat and I'll keep track of them. Okay, perfect. So let's see. And it looks like I've got about 30 minutes left. Okay. So now I want to move into some emerging pests. Um, you know, I wanted to, to specifically give you guys things uh, to look out for since these are emerging pests in Virginia. Um, but also this is kind of selfish for me because the more eyes we have looking for these pests, the more data uh, we get. So hopefully we can all kind of take this on together. And we'll start with the spotted lanternfly. And I'm sure everyone here has heard a lot about the spotted lanternfly. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, here we have an image of the different life stages, starting with the egg masses that are laid in the fall and over winter. The nymphs hatch in the spring. They go through four nymphal instars. The first three are black, and then the fourth develops this red coloring. And then here are the adults that are active now um, and will be active uh, into the fall. Here we see some photos of um, some eggs, some spotted lanternfly egg masses. This adult female is laying eggs, individual eggs in rows, and then covering them with this protective covering. Uh, this protective covering starts out this kind of bright white color, but then uh, eventually fades to this like kind of tan gray color um, and cracks over time. Egg masses are an inch and a half long, they're flat and gray, and they're laid on smooth surfaces. And I find them uh, kind of cryptic and camouflaged and hard to detect. They really just look like a blob of clay that's been kind of pushed onto a tree branch. But this stage is really important to be able to detect because spotted lanternflies can and will lay egg masses on pretty much any flat surface that is outside. So certainly on tree branches and tree trunks, but also um, benches, stones, rocks, lawn furniture, vehicles, rusty metal, really anything that's outside. And so it's important for us to develop a search image to be able to detect these spotted lanternfly egg masses because this is the life stage that's really easily transported to one area um, and to, to a different area. The eggs hatch in the spring, and so here are some more photos of the nymphs. They start off black, and then by their fourth instar, they develop this red coloring. And then here are the adults that start to emerge in the summer. Um, it, adults are about an inch and a half long, and usually you see them with their wings at rest behind them, but when they do open up their wings, that's when you can see this bright red color in their underwing there. So spotted lanternfly definitely prefers tree of heaven, which itself is an invasive plant. And you know, when we first heard that spotted lanternfly had been detected in North America, I think everyone thought, great, this can be a great biocontrol for tree of heaven. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case because they also feed on a lot of other species. There's a, a long list of hosts that the spotted lanternfly will feed on. Um, they also tend to prefer grapevine, maple, and walnut. The spotted lanternfly are phloem feeders, so they insert their piercing sucking mouth parts into the plant tissue and feed on the phloem. 
Um, some tree damage has been observed, but we're still really learning what the, the long-term impacts of spotted lantern fly feeding will be on uh, the plants that they feed on. Um, it may reduce grape and fruit yield. And as they feed, they uh, secrete honeydew, which is a sugary, sticky substance. And then on that honeydew, sooty mold develops. So that's what you're seeing here in these photos, that black sooty mold that's growing on the honeydew that was excreted by the spotted lanternfly. Um, this sooty mold doesn't have any direct impacts on plants, but it certainly reduces uh, leaf area for photosynthesis, so it may have some long-term impacts to the plant. And of course, we all know that spotted lanternfly can just be a huge nuisance pest. So, um, you know, this is just not something that you want to see when you walk out of your door into your yard. Here's the most recent map um, of spotted lanternfly distribution in North America. And so if we zoom into Virginia, you can see where we've detected it in Virginia. Um, it was first found in the Winchester, Frederick area in 2018, and since then it's spread south, mainly in the western part of the state. However, it was uh, just detected in the Richmond area, so it does unfortunately appear like it's moving into the eastern part of the state as well. Um, the red counties on this map are part of the Virginia Spotted Lanternfly Quarantine that's regulated by VDAX. And so if you um, live in one of these quarantined counties, it's uh, highly encouraged that you inspect your vehicle before you leave the quarantine area. The counties in orange are not part of the quarantine, but we have detected small spotted lanternfly populations in those counties. So when we ask folks to help us look for spotted lanternfly, if you are in one of these counties in red and you find spotted lanternfly, we're really not so much interested in that information because we know there are well-established populations in those areas. Um, if you detect uh, large populations of spotted lanternflies in some of the orange counties, that could be useful information, but certainly in the counties that are not yet highlighted, that would be really helpful information to know. Um, so what can we all do? Unfortunately, we're past the point of eradication. Spotted lanternfly has established here in Virginia, but there is still a huge effort to slow the spread and suppress local populations. And so the best thing we can do is all learn how to identify spotted lanternfly and always be vigilant. Um, always inspect vehicles and outdoor equipment before leaving an infested area and do not park or store items near trees. And you know, our foresters always laugh when I tell them not to park near trees because that's inevitable, you're gonna park near trees. But just kind of be smart about it. Like maybe don't park your trailer for a week next to uh, a line of Alanthus trees. And if you do have to do something like that, then just make sure you thoroughly inspect um, that equipment before you move it to a new area. This is also a great time to remove any tree of heaven on your property. Since Tree of Heaven is a preferred host, um, that's one of the best things we can do to uh, suppress spotted lanternfly populations is just to get rid of that Tree of Heaven. And I'm, of course, you guys all know that just cutting down an Alanthus tree is not gonna solve the problem because they vigorously re-sprout. So we do recommend using some herbicide. And we have a couple of publications on our website for different ways to control Alanthus. Um, we always say don't move firewood because moving firewood certainly has the potential to move different uh, life stages of spotted lanternfly and other invasive insects as well. Um, if you just find a few, a few spotted lanternfly, uh, go ahead and kill what you find and please report new uh, spotted lanternfly detections to either your local extension agent or a Department of Forestry employee. And whenever we talk about spotted lanternfly, we also get a lot of questions about treatment. And um, you guys probably know about this publication, but if not, I just wanted to direct you to uh, Virginia Cooperative, Cooperative Extension's Best Management Practices for Spotted Lanternfly in Yards and Landscapes. Um, this is a, a really good publication that lists different treatment methods for different times of the year when different uh, lanternfly life stages are out. And so I think um, if it's okay with you, Devin, I'm just gonna roll through the, the next few topics and then we can do questions all at once at the end. Okay, great. 
Um, so next, I wanted to get into laurel wilt disease, which is certainly an emerging forest health threat in Virginia. And so this is a disease caused by a fungal pathogen, but the fungus is vectored by the red bay ambrosia beetle. Both the beetle and the fungus are native to Asia, which means they are invasive here in North America. Laurel wilt disease was first detected in North America in 2002 near Savannah, Georgia, and it has caused the death of millions of red bay trees. And so I'm gonna quickly go through um, these maps that just show the progression of this disease in North America. So here was the initial detection in 2002 in Georgia. And again, this was on red bay trees and you can see it just spreading along the coast there. Um, now we start to see it move a little bit more inland And then in 2019, we saw a pop up in sassafras in Kentucky and Tennessee. So this was really concerning for us in Virginia because we were focusing all of our survey efforts in southeast Virginia because that's where we have red bay trees. And so we were just assuming that the disease would come up the coast and enter Virginia um, along the coast there in southeast Virginia where we have red bay. But then when we saw uh, Kentucky and Tennessee detect this disease on sassafras, we realized that we needed to be surveying other parts of Virginia as well. And then uh, definitely by 2021, when a detection was made in Tennessee, just south of the Tennessee-Virginia border, we, uh, we, we made our way over to Southwest Virginia <laughs> to do some surveys. And this is the case of when you look for it in the right area, you find it. So we found our first laurel wilt disease um, infected plant in 2021 in Scott County, Virginia, which was just over that uh, Tennessee, Virginia border. So what does laurel wilt disease uh, impact? Well, it impacts all species in the laurel family. And so in Virginia, that is red bay, which we find in Southeast Virginia, but also sassafras and northern spice bush, which is found pretty much statewide. Um, I did also list avocado here because while we don't really grow avocados in Virginia, this may be sad for all of us that enjoy some guacamole. Now, I also wanted to mention that um, I do get a lot of questions about mountain laurel, rhododendron, and sweet bay magnolia, um, but these species are not part of the laurel family, so they are not impacted by laurel wilt disease. They are not hosts of this disease. Okay, so to fully understand laurel wilt disease and how it um, infects plants, we need to understand a little bit about ambrosia beetles. Ambrosia beetles are most attracted to stress trees. We have a lot of species of native ambrosia beetles and they generally only attack stress trees. Um, they carry spores of a fungal pathogen, and so they bore into plants and they create tunnels. And because they're carrying spores of a fungus, when they bore into the plant, they inoculate the plant. Then they create a fungal garden within the plant, in the tunnels, and that's what they feed on. So even though ambrosia beetles are um, boring into plants, into trees, um, they're not actually feeding on the plant tissue. They're feeding on the fungus that they've brought with them into the plant. And so that's how it works with laurel wilt disease. It's the red bay ambrosia beetle. And again, this is uh, an invasive insect. So while most of our native ambrosia beetles only attack stress trees, the red bay ambrosia beetle can attack a healthy plant. So the red bay ambrosia beetle finds a host, um, enters the plant, the fungus that the red bay ambrosia beetle has brought into the plant, colonizes the xylem cells. This disrupts water movement and leads to tree decline and death. Then new beetles emerge and they find new trees and infect new trees with this fungal pathogen that they're vectoring. So here are some signs and symptoms of laurel wilt disease. Um, the first thing we look for is leaf wilting and discoloration. So these photos on the right are of red bay. You can see the browning and wilting of the leaves on red bay. And then the photos on the left are of sassafras. You can see the dead sassafras trees here. 
We also look for discoloration of the outer sapwood. If you're able to peel the bark off of an infected tree, you'll be able to see this, see this streaking just underneath the bark. And we also look for frass tube toothpicks. And this is what happens when the beetles bore into the tree. When the beetles bore into the tree, um, these, uh, these frass tube toothpicks um, Will, will emerge from the tree. And now again, this, this, uh, these toothpicks, you, you'll probably see this on a tree infected with any type of ambrosia beetle. And we have lots of native ambrosia beetles. So just because you see these toothpicks does not mean the tree is infested with laurel wilt disease. But if you see these toothpicks along with the other signs and symptoms, then it's a really good indicator that the plant might be infected with the disease. So what can we do? Um, there are preventative treatments, but these treatments um, are for healthy trees. Once a tree is infected with the disease, there's not much you can do. So when that happens, we recommend chipping, burning, or covering infected wood material to reduce the spread of the inoculum. Um, of course, we always say don't move firewood. And if you think you have laurel wilt disease, if you see uh, these different signs and symptoms on sassafras or spice bush or red bay, please let us know because currently the only known detection of laurel wilt in Virginia is in Scott County in Southwest Virginia. All right, um, a few minutes left. So I wanted to mention beech leaf disease, which is a uh, emerging forest health threat in Virginia. It's a newly described disease. It was first identified in Ohio in 2012. <clears throat> and it, it uh, leads to darkening of leaves in between leaf veins and thinning of canopies. When they first saw these symptoms, they couldn't figure out what was causing it. The causal agent was unknown at first. And so it actually wasn't until recently that nematodes were investigated. Um, and we now believe that a species of Lytolinchus nematode is associated with the beech leaf disease. This is a foliar nematode that overwinters in buds and attached leaves. So here's a map of all detections of beech leaf disease in North America. Um, you can see that it was first detected in Virginia in Prince William County in 2021. And then we detected it in Fairfax County in 2022. So currently we've only detected it in two counties up in Northern Virginia, Prince William and Fairfax. So the first symptom of beech leaf disease is this intervenal thickening and darkening of leaf tissue. Um, and this is really distinct. It's just these dark bands on beech leaves in between those lateral leaf veins. Now this is best observed by looking up into the canopy so that the leaves are backlit by the sun. Um, and when you're, when you're looking up at, um, at beech trees, you'll, you'll see that beech leaves often overlap and where they overlap, you'll see a dark area. And so that can sometimes be confusing, but you're really looking for these dark bands that are in between those lateral leaf veins. It's pretty distinctive. Um, later, later on into the disease, you'll start to see leaf discoloration and curling, which eventually leads to reduced bud and leaf production, um, leading to thin canopies, and eventually tree mortality within two to seven years, most commonly observed in the smaller understory trees. Now, when you start looking for um, beech leaf disease, you're going to notice a lot of different things on beech leaves. <laughs> and so I wanted to give, uh, show a few photos of things that are not beech leaf disease. And the first one is aphid damage. And so I see this a lot. Um, if you first see this photo right here on the left, you may think, oh, this looks like that dark banding in between the lateral leaf veins. But the giveaway here that it's not beech leaf disease is that it's curled, the edge of the leaf is curled. And then if you turn that leaf over, you'll be able to actually see the aphids or see their exoskeletons. Um, so this is not beech leaf disease, this is just damage from a leaf curling aphid. 
There's also some mite damage that's commonly seen on beech leaves. Um, and it just produces these kind of like patches of discoloration on the leaf. And then we also tend to see beech anthracnose. And this is a fungal pathogen that causes browning and wilting of leaves. So again, this is not beech leaf disease. Um, this is anthracnose. What we're really looking for is that dark banding between the lateral leaf veins. So if you do happen to see that dark banding between the leaf veins um, and find what you think could be beech leaf disease, please take a photo, record the location, and report it to your local DOF forester or an extension agent, or you can email it directly to our program at this email address right here, foresthealth at dof.virginia.gov. And I think I've listed, and this is my personal email. You could also just email me directly. So that's, um, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Thanks so much, Laura. You are so awesome. That was a great presentation. Um, we have a bunch of questions here. I think people are really excited about this. Yeah, this was a really good webinar and it's going to be posted. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, so somebody has a specific question about, um, Nancy's concerned about pine bark beetles in Rockingham County. What should people do if they identify something like that? Um, and they need to report it, which I think you've just said. <laughs> Yeah, um, so for definitely for pine bark beetles, the best thing you could do is contact your local area forester. And if you go just to our like Virginia Department of Forestry webpage, there's a, like a button right on the homepage that says find a forester. And so type in Rockingham County and you'll get at least one or two contacts of local folks that you can reach out to and let them know that you've you found pine bark beetles or any other forest issue really. Okay, and along those lines, if you want to evaluate the health of a privately owned forest, is that something that the Department of Forestry can help with? You know, our foresters, um, we, we're, we're there to, to help you and, you know, help manage your, your forest in a, in a healthy way. Um, definitely reach out to them. I will say our folks are, you know, spread pretty thin, so it might not be something that they'll be able to get to right away, but I, I think that's definitely your first stop. Checking in with your local area forester, see if they can swing by. If it's a specific forest health issue, they might just refer you to our program. We have a few folks that can come out and do site visits as well, um, but that the, the first stop should be with your local area forester. They're there to help as, as they can, as they're available. Perfect. And then we had a question about laurel wilt disease, which I think we answered um, in the chat. We figured out it's a it's not going to be affected because it's a different. I think that's the genus. Ben, ben Dukes knew the answer. Um, okay. And then someone else has a, a comment about beech leaf disease in Stafford County. Does anyone else have questions? If you have any additional questions here at the end, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead and ask Lori. I had a question about the um, Nancy. We can't hear you. Yeah. So I have a question about the laurel wilt disease mm -hmm. um, and the northern spice bush. Um, so they actually infect the the bushes themselves of the spice bush. Yeah, so it's it's the um, the beetle that bores into the plant tissue and then inoculates the plant with the fungal pathogen. And it's a wilt pathogen. And so that's what causes the, the death of the plant. Um, but yeah, it would be the beetle actually boring into the plant. And I would assume that would cause um, the wilt to be visible and maybe kill the bush pretty quickly since it's a bush and not a tree. Is that right? I don't know. I don't know if the timeline is that different, um, but I think in general, laurel wilt disease does, the, the symptoms do occur pretty soon after the plant is infected. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know if there's a difference between um, like the timeline of symptoms between a spice bush versus like a red bay tree. Um, but even with a red bay tree, I think soon after 
in infection, you'll start to see the symptoms and mortality is imminent. <laughs> Would you, can I ask a question, and this is great, thank you, really helpful. Would you advise then maybe not planting um, northern spice bush and, and sassafras for immunity purposes um, because of the risk of disease? Um, that's a tough question. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know if we're there yet telling people to not plant those species. Um, but I think that's why monitoring for the disease is so important so that we have in we have information of where we're seeing it. Um, and so we can, you know, I think make smart decisions based on where the disease currently is. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question at all. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm not ready to tell folks to stop planting sassafras and spice bush because you know they're they're wonderful plants and there's a lot of benefits from those plants and trees. Um, but so I think right now we're really just focusing on monitoring so we know exactly where the disease is in Virginia. Okay, thanks. Um, and so yeah, so I, I want to thank all of you guys for listening, and you 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 all are like a huge resource for us because you can be out looking for these things. And so if you if you see signs and symptoms of any of the diseases and invasive insects that we talked about today, please don't hesitate to report it to us. Lori, uh, as a follow up on that, um, A is we know now that the Laurel wilt disease goes to at least two other um, species. One, my first question is um, any other species within those families that are being affected? And then um, is there any way to, to see the, the disease or, or somehow to stop the, the spread of the beetle, you know, coming into this area? What do we do if we see it? And how do we take care of that? Uh, is there any way of preventing the wilting? Yeah, so I'm getting, going back to that list of hosts because really it's anything in the Laurel family. All right. To my knowledge, anything in the Laurel family can be impacted by Laurel wilt disease. So the ones that I've circled here, red bay sassafras, northern spice bush, those are the ones that we're focused on in Virginia because they're the most common, but anything in the Laurel family can be impacted to my knowledge. Okay. Um, I think in terms of like, what can we do to prevent it not much. I mean, you saw that progression map that I showed you and how quickly it spread up the coast. Um, but also during that progression map, I don't know if you guys noticed, at one point there was a huge jump from like the natural expansion on the coast where it was probably just the beetles movement to like all the way inland over to like, I think Alabama. So that was certainly not a beetle flying from the coast over to Alabama. So that was, you know, certainly like human mediated dispersal, whether it's movement of firewood or something else. So that's probably the biggest thing that we can do is just don't move firewood, don't move infected material. Um, when we find areas that are impacted with Laurel wilt disease, um, you know, de destroying that wood so that it's not moved to a new location. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lori. This was a fantastic webinar. I'm going to repost the link here in the chat and I'll try and get the recording up um, soon. Um, so it'll be up there and, and this can be a great resource for people to go back to. And if you have any questions or anything like that or information you wanna pass along, you can go ahead and email me and I'll help get you in touch with the right people. Thanks so much, Lori. And uh, we'll see y'all back here September 14th for um, Mike Goatley's turf update. <laughs> Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank you very much. Very